Good evening. It's 8 o'clock in Yerushalayim, and it's time to begin our regular halacha shir. This is webyshiver.org. Our topic is astrology and the approach of the great poskin, the great halachic authorities to astrology. What we have seen up till now are two camps, a majority view which embraces the workings of astrology, a minority group led by Rambam and the rationalists who totally reject the validity of astrology and hold that it's even worse than than anything else imaginable. Uh, We then saw the middle path of of the Meiri, according to whom certain elements of astrology have basis in the natural laws of the universe. After all, everyone knows that if you're doing heavy labor, you should not do it in the hot noontime, in the noontime sun. Everyone knows that. There are movements of the of the celestial bodies which are important for us to know about because of basic laws of nature. On the other hand, uh, some of it is just nonsense and magical, and that must be ignored. Then at the end of our previous shi'ur, we, we left off last time with looking at the, uh, at the opinion of the Rashba, who also takes a middle approach. His approach was a little bit different. Let's get this nicely on the screen. There we go. Uh, uh, the Rashba said that uh, there are plenty of examples in Jewish practice where we seem to rely upon astral influences For example, it's common in many Jewish communities to this very day uh, to perform marriages only in the first half of the lunar month. All the Jewish months are based on the lunar cycle, not the solar cycle. And in the first half of every Jewish month, the first half of every lunar month, the moon is growing in size. And because of the auspicious nature of the growth of the moon, it's, it was customary, it remains customary in many, in many uh, communities to uh, perform marriages only in the first half of the month. This is not astrology, the Rashba says, and we saw this last time, that the Rashba says what's going on here is not astrology, what's going on here is a simana tova, it's a simon tov, it's an it's a, it's a auspicious sign not the, not the influence of the stars, but it's somehow, so, somehow good luck. I mean, we don't understand yet exactly uh, what he means by the difference between astral influences, which are bad, and simon tov, uh, uh, good luck, which is fine, but he seems to be making some distinction. He, 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 give, he gives other examples, and we saw this at the very end of last week. He spoke about uh, the Malche Yisrael, the, the kings who were anointed, the Jewish kings back in biblical times, who were anointed by the uh, uh, running spring, by the spring where the water is constantly running out, as a simon tov. Nothing, nothing uh, uh, superstitious about it. It's just a simon tov that the, that the rain, R-E-I-G-N, their rain should continue forever, just like the water continually flows out of the uh, out of the spring. Uh, we saw other examples. It was customary then, and remains customary in some communities, to pour out wine in front of the chatan uh, and kala, uh, not because it's some superstitious uh, magical procedure, but it's a simintov that their marriage should be fruitful and uh, all should go well. Well, what will you see? The, the Rashba has taken some middle approach, which is very hard to understand. We're going to come to an understanding in the moment. Uh, but uh, in simple terms, before we come to the understanding of what he means, there's something wrong with superstitious. There's something wrong with superstition and astrology and everything connected with that, that we reject. On the other hand, there's something else called a simon tov, a good sign, good luck, and that we embrace as being valid practice. Now we have to try to figure out what exactly is it that he's talking about? What kind of distinction is he making here? Uh, What exactly is kosher and what exactly is prohibited? How are we supposed to tell the difference between these two things? 
Well, let's see if I can get the Shaloh HaKodesh. Here we go. The, 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 the Shaloh HaKodesh, we're about to look at a text. The, the author's name was Rabbi Horowitz, but if you, in the Yeshiva world, if you say that you just learned the opinion of Rabbi Horowitz, no one will know who you're talking about. Uh, he's a you know, 17th century uh, authority from Germany. He wrote this book called the Shnei Luchot Habrit. I only wrote a, um, I, I only gave you a, uh, uh, an abbreviation of his name. Everyone calls it the Shalom HaKodesh. It was Rashi Tevot. That's just an abbreviation for the name of the book. The full name of the book, let's get that on chat. Shnei Luchot Habrit is the full name of the book. The Two Tablets of the Covenant. Now, th this book, written by Rabbi Horowitz, he, he, he's one of the few people who combined, in a single personality, greatness in Halacha and Kabbalah. And therefore, this book, Shnei Luchas Abris, is a, is a treasure house of important Halachic analysis and important mystical analysis. It's all blended together in this book, and, and, the, uh, and the subsequent uh, generations of rabbis quote his opinions, both in Kabbalistic matters and in halachic matters, over and over and over again, an extraordinarily influential book. Now, in order to understand his opinion, we need one background, one element of background. Uh, we're going to look at the... Um, at the text of the Tur, the Tur was the great predecessor of the Shulchan Aruch, the Tur, at the very end of the Middle Ages, the, the Tur was that code of Jewish law, which brought together at the end of the Middle Ages, at the end of the period of the Rishonim, codified and brought together and, and more or less finalized the opinions of the great Rishonim. Let's look at the text of the Tur, because it's this text which is going to lead the Shaloh HaKodesh, the Shnei Luchas Abris, to his understanding of what is wrong with astrology and what's okay with Simon Tov. We'll understand the difference between them, and then once we understand the difference, we'll know how to apply. We'll know how to apply this in any case which actually comes uh, comes up. The the uh, the tour quotes Abaya in the Gemara. Abaya in the Gemara says as follows. Hashtag Amat Simon Amelsahi. Since we know that Shimon Tov, a good Shimon, a good sign, is okay, even though we reject astrology, even though we embrace the value, since we know that we embrace and accept the value of Shimon Tov, good signs, since we know that, the conclusion is, Abaya teaches us in the Gemara, Yehe Inish Rogil Lamechal. Everyone should have the practice of eating Bereshata on Rosh Hashanah, on the Jewish New Year. Everyone should eat an etrog, kra, that's a, a courgette, a, a, a squash, rubia, a, a carrot, a karti, some uh, leeks, a silka, beets, tamari, dates. Uh, these are foods which everyone should eat on Rosh Hashanah. Well, why should everyone eat these uh, fruits, uh, these things on Rosh Hashanah? Uh, 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 rubia, the reason you should eat uh, carrots, rubia, is because the Hebrew or the Aramaic name for carrot, rubia, sounds like a lot. It's similar to the word for a lot in Yiddish. In Yiddish, they call uh, carrots meiren, and meiren in Yiddish also sounds like a lot. It's similar to the word meaning a lot. R Rashi explains, Rashi explains that uh, since it's a lot, what we want is yirbu zechuyotenu, when we eat the carrots, the word carrot means a lot, uh, we say maybe we have a lot of merit. That we should have a lot. Sounds like carrots. We eat the carrots and we say, let our merits multiply. A carte, when we eat the, the squash, the word sounds like cut off. Kores, cut off. And we say, we say, may our enemies be cut off. Silka, when we eat beets, 
the word sounds like the word, the word silka in Aramaic or selic in Hebrew sounds like the word to, to disperse, to go away, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to leave the area. She is talku avonenu, may our sins depart, may our sins leave us. Tamari, why do we eat dates? Because the word sounds like the word to finish. Yitamu sonenu, may our enemies be finished. Kra, uh, why do we eat uh, this vegetable? Because uh, it grows quickly and we want our merits to grow quickly. Well, there are many different minhagim. The tour says many different minhagim. Call makam or makam lufi minhago. Every Jewish community has its own practices, what they eat, especially on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, you are probably familiar with the minhag, which in, is operative in my house as well, to eat apple dipped in honey on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, uh, in Ashkenaz, that's my Ashkenaz practice, in Ashkenaz communities, we typically eat apple with honey at the beginning of the meal. Lama, so as to say, May we have a sweet new year. To have a sweet new year, we eat an apple uh, with honey. All, all of this is sounding a little bit superstitious, isn't it? Uh, uh, just because you eat an apple with honey, that's going to make a sweet, auspicious year for you. Uh, or in the other communities, just because you eat a carrot, so you're going to have, you're going to multiply your merits. I mean, it all sounds a little bit superstitious. Uh, the Provincia in southern France, back in those days, at the end of the Middle Ages, they, they, they bring all kinds of strange things to the table on Rosh Hashanah in Provence, in the southern France, they eat the, the head of a, of a sheep, a sheep's head, rea lungs, they eat the lungs of the animal. So as to say, we want to be at the head and not the tail, and since we want to be the head and not the tail, so we eat the head and the lungs and not the tail of the animal. Uh, rea. They're specifically, the, the lungs are also eaten because lungs are very light and airy. And, uh, uh, well, we want to have a light and airy life. Uh, Rav Meir, the Rotenberg, he, he ate, uh, the Rav Meir, the Rotenberg, he ate, Ashkenaz Rishon, uh, he ate uh, the, the head of a gazelle. Zechel Eloshel Yitzchak, because in order to remember the the uh, the Akeda, the binding of Isaac. Well, uh, the the tour brings us a long list of these bizarre, apparently superstitious activities that were common practices in Jewish communities throughout the days of the Rishonim, throughout the Middle Ages, and the basis of all of them. The tour says is even though we reject superstition and astrology, we accept and embrace a simon tov. And these are all examples of simon tov, and they're fine. We have to have some, some understanding of what makes a simon tov acceptable uh, and uh, uh, leaving astrology and superstition uh, to be prohibited. Uh, what is it about these simon tov examples which which uh, makes them kosher that they seem to be uh, outright examples of superstition well um, the uh, uh, the words of the Shalom HaKodesh the Shnei Luchas Abris Rav Horowitz his words in explaining this matter are as follows Lichora apparently Yeshul Hakshot Apparently, there's a problem here. Eating a carrot is going to improve your merits? I mean, what, what's the connection? Why should eating a, eating a carrot improve your, your merits? If you want to improve your merits, go out and do good things. Don't eat carrots. Emet, it's true. It's true that the words sound similar. Rubia in Hebrew or in Aramaic uh, modern Hebrew uses the word gezer, but back then it was called rubia. It's true that the word rubia sounds like a lot, like the word meaning a lot, 
הרבה, but what difference does that make? אבל איך נרמז, שם זכויותינו ירבו. Even if it's true, even if it's true that eating a carrot will make a lot of something, because the word means like a lot, there's not a single hint in carrots that what is going to improve is your zechuyot, even if there's some reason. That, that, that carrots make a lot of something, because that's the name of the carrot, what's it have to do with your merits? That's not mentioned at all. Uh, maybe it improves something else. Who knows? I mean, it's just terribly superstitious. And similarly, uh, with the, the leeks, uh, the word leek sounds like cut off, uh, and it cut off our enemies. Well, well, even if eating leeks do cut something off, uh, well, what's it have to do with your enemies? Well, well, maybe it means something else. Maybe it means the opposite. Who knows what it means? There's no reason why it has to mean anything. The, 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 whole, the whole idea is bizarre. Ella, however, the only explanation which I, the Shalom HaKodesh, is speaking, the only explanation which the Shalom HaKodesh can come up with to make sense out of this, and he was the great halachist and the great Kabbalist in the early period of the Ashkenaz Rishonim, Ha'inyinu, the whole issue is as follows. Ein shum rem is bachilus pri. Eating these fruits accomplishes nothing, and it's all just silly. Uh, an apple and honey accomplishes nothing except satisfy your hunger if you're hungry, satisfy your sweet tooth if you, if you want something sweet, but it's surely not going to accomplish anything of a spiritual nature. Eating an apple with honey or any of the other things, it, it's all just eating, it's all just food, that's all it is. Rock, however, hapri husimen, Eating the fruit is a sign to remind you of something. It's a reminder. A simon tov is a good sign. What that means is it's a reminder. These foods are supposed to remind you of something that you might have forgotten. Sheyizgor ha'adam v'yit orer b'tshuva. Eating the fruit is supposed to remind you that now it's Rosh Hashanah, and now it's time to get your act together and repent. Now it's time to do tshuva. Eating the fruits are supposed to remind you to do tshuva, and tshuva is good. Tshuva is of great spiritual value, but it's the tshuva which is important. The fruit is only supposed to be a reminder to remind you to get your act together and do tshuva. The yitpalel al hadavar hazeh, and each of the fruits that you eat, according to all the different minhagim, all the different practices, all the different kinds of things they ate on Rosh Hashanah, there were little prayers which were said together with each fruit. Uh, when they were eating uh, honey and apple, they said a little prayer. Uh, May God make it a sweet year. Uh, when they were eating uh, uh, karte, when they were eating leeks, uh, cut off, meaning cut off, is it, may our enemies be cut off. May our enemies be cut off. May God help us and protect us from our enemies. Each of these fruits was an opportunity to remind you to utter, to say a little prayer to God. The prayer is of value. The fruit is uh, <laughs> just a simple reminder. If you skip the fruit and say the little prayer, You've accomplished something important. Prayer is important. If you, if you omit the prayer and just eat the fruit, that's silly. That's superstitious. Eating the fruit is not going to accomplish anything. It's the prayer which is important. If you're going to omit one or the other, you're... Uh, you're, you're diabetic and don't want to eat the sugar, swallow the sugar in the, in the honey, you can still say the prayer. The prayer is the important part, not the eating of the fruit. And anyone who thinks that eating the fruit is going to accomplish anything of a spiritual nature, that's just silly. That's part of superstition that we reject. What is valuable here is the prayer that we recite with each fruit, depending upon uh, what your community is commonly eating on Rosh Hashanah. Ritzonah Lomar, this means, 
This means that if you put carrots on the table on Rosh Hashanah and eat them, this is in order to remind you that's to remind you to pray to God that your merits be increased and that prayer is important, that prayer is valuable. Uh, when you see the leaks, then you'll be reminded to pray that God cut off your enemies. Bottom line, he says, Ha'ikah, the main point here is the hit olarut, the hatfila. The main point in eating the fruits is not the eating of the fruits. The main point is to get your act together and repent. The main point is to attach yourself to HaKadosh Baruch to attach yourself to God, and we do that through prayer, and that is of value. After you've said the prayer and eaten the apple with the honey or whatever it is that your custom is to eat, then we pray that our, our prayers uh, be accepted. Well, well the, the, the Shalom HaKadosh, the great Kabbalist, and the great halachist has explained to us the difference between a simon tov that we embrace as being a valid part of our religious practice as opposed to superstition, which is silly and, of course, rejected. What makes the simon tov valuable is not the spring next to which the king is anointed, Anointing a king next to a spring is not going to have anything to do with the length of his reign. Oh, but it should remind the king to attach himself to God and the spiritual enterprise and to do tshuva and to pray to God for a good reign where he will be able to act and help his people, act on behalf of his people, and that prayer is important, that tshuva is important. Getting married in the first half of the month uh, is not a, there's no power in the moon growing in the first half of the month to make a marriage successful or not successful. It has nothing to do with the influence of the moon. Uh, but the growing moon will remind the chatan, will remind the kala, will remind the groom and the bride that they must attach themselves to a spiritual life they must repent, they must do tshuva, and they have to daven, they have to pray to God for a, a successful for a successful marriage. And that is of spiritual value. Oh, Simon Tov, a good sign we accept, we embrace, not because the sign is going to do anything, but the sign is merely a reminder to us to engage in the spiritual enterprise of tshuva, prayer, and ascending the ladder of spirituality. Astrology and uh, superstition are silly and wrong because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, those things simply have no influence upon our lives. Uh, or water as you quite point out, is equal to Torah in many, uh, in many contexts, in, in, in many practices in different communities, equating water with Torah. Uh, it's the water which is supposed to remind you to engage in the enterprise of Torah and mitzvahs. It's uh, the water itself is just water. Uh, but if it reminds you, if the water reminds you to engage in Torah and mitzvahs, then a good spiritual result has come from this, and that's called a sin in Tov. Okay, now, now, now uh, with this we understand the approach of the Rajbo. The middle approach of the Rajbo, uh, who, who, who is willing to accept certain apparently astrological practices in the Jewish communities, like getting married in the first half of the month when the moon is growing and these other things. Uh, uh, the, 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 the practices he's willing to embrace are the practices which are not rooted in the belief 
that the astral bodies or the superstitious activity actually has an impact upon our lives. Rather, the things he's willing to accept are simon tov, things which are merely intended to remind us to engage in the spiritual life, uh, to pray, and to uh, engage in the enterprise of Torah and mitzvahs. That's good. Well, let's see how all of this plays out in the Shulchan Aruch. Before us is the text of the Shulchan Aruch. Where I point to it. I used to know how to do this. There it is. The, uh, the, the text of the Shulchan Aruch is as follows. Ein sho'alim b'chazim u'kochavim. Uh, it is prohibited to make inquiry of the astrologers. It is prohibited to approach the astrologers and ask them for a, uh, a reading, to ask them for astrological advice. It's also prohibited to use lotteries in order to decide what to do. You can't decide whether whether to do this business deal or that business deal. You can't decide whether to travel to this country or that country. You can't decide what to do. Draw lots. Roll the dice. Flip the coin. uh, And let chance tell you what to do. We do not, uh, we Jews do not depend upon goralot, upon lotteries. The concept no different than rolling the dice or flipping the coin. We don't rely upon upon that to tell us what to do. We instead uh, insist upon doing your best to come to a rational decision about what the best path is to take. And once you've done your best, to figure out which the best path is to take, to go left or to right, to do this business deal or that business deal, to go to this country or that country. Well, once you've, uh, once you've applied human reason as well as you can to determine what the correct future path is, then take that path, not because of a flip of the coin, not because of a roll of the dice, not because of a lottery, but because you've done your best to figure out with your own capacity for human reason uh, what to do. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. What about the lots on Yom Kippur? Yeah, there, 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 are plenty, there are plenty of examples, division of the land by lots. There, there are plenty of examples of even great rabbis in modern times who have used lotteries in order to decide what to do. There are examples of Arya Levine, there are examples of the Gaon Mavilna. Uh, there, there, there are, there, there are uh, a number of examples of great rabbis who have actually used lotteries in order to make decisions, seemingly uh, flying in the face of what it says in the Shulchan Aruch, in the text we've just read. It was recently published uh, uh, a huge three-volume uh, biography of the Gra, the Gaon Mavilna, which has a lengthy chapter on exactly this issue, that the Gra, the Gaon Mavilna himself, uh, seems to have used a, a lottery, and there's plenty of historical evidence assembled in the biography of the Gra. Uh, the biographer did us the, the, did us the favor of adding lengthy footnotes, assembling together all the other examples he could find of great rabbis in modern times who used lotteries in order to make decisions. When Rabbi Aaron Kutler could not decide, uh, stuck in, 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 a, in the middle of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, could not make a decision. Uh, we had an opportunity to, to flee and could not make a decision whether to go to America, to flee to America or to flee to Eretz Israel. Couldn't decide what to do. He made a lottery, he drew lots. And that, that's what led him to the United States. And not to uh, and not to Eretz Israel. There are plenty of examples you can find. If you if you want to see specific examples, send me an email message. I'll send you back uh, references. You can re- read about all the examples of great rabbis, even recent rabbis who've done exactly this. And it seems to fly in the face. Seems to be uh, simple, con- simply wrong and prohibited according to what we've just read in the Shulchan Aruch. However, uh, if you uh, if you look carefully at all of the examples. And I I spent some time studying all of the examples I could find. I've got quite a number of them. 
uh, studying all the examples I could find, beginning with the division of the land in Eretz Yisrael according to lots, uh, including the uh, uh, the uh, designation of the uh, of the different goats on Yom Kippur for different purposes on the basis of a lottery, uh, down to and including uh, all the examples I could find of great rabbis who actually used lotteries to decide what to do. Looking through all of the examples that I could find very carefully, I come, I come myself uh, to the following simple, straightforward conclusion. In every single case that I have found, there's no, absolutely no rational basis for, for, for uh, preferring one path over another. We have two goats on Yom Kippur, which are identical, and the Torah insists that they be identical goats, the same size, the same color, in, in, in every way, I, two identical goats, and since the goats are in every way identical, which is a requirement for the two goats on, uh, on Yom Kippur, there's no rational uh, reason why one should be used for one purpose on Yom Kippur and the other should be used for another purpose on Yom Kippur. There's absolutely no difference between them and therefore absolutely no basis upon which to make a rational decision, which is for which purpose. In those cases, where there's absolutely no rational basis for making a clear-headed decision to go this way or that way, choose this or choose that. Those are the cases in which the great rabbis actually use lotteries from time to time after having exhausted any possibility of making a rational decision, said, let us leave it entirely in the hands of God as you correctly point out on chat, let's leave it in the hands of God. Uh, we'll do a lottery in concept. No different than flipping a coin or rolling the dice. Uh, I cannot uh, make my own decision. I've, I, I've, I've uh, exhausted my ability to see any difference between these two goats. I, ca I cannot see any reason at all why one should be preferable for this purpose and the other goat should be preferable for the other purpose. Let's leave it to the lottery. The lottery is embraced only when every effort to make a rational decision is frustrated, when uh, reason fails us, uh, then, uh, then there's some room for a lottery. Okay, that's what the Shavonok says, and that's the approach of the great rabbis. Uh, the Haggah, the Ramah, in his notes on the Shulchan Aruch, gives us the reason for all of this. The reason is, because it's a verse in the Torah. The reason we do not consult astrologers, the reason we do not uh, rely upon lotteries or flipping the coin, is a verse in the Torah. It says in the Torah, Tamim Tehiyeh Im Hashem Elokecha. The verse in the Torah commands us to be pure and at one with God, and that means rejecting anything of a superstitious nature. Call Shekane, all the more so, the Ramah says, if the Torah commands us to be tamim, to be pure and at one with God, Asul Ashol Bakosmim, if it is prohibited to consult the astrologers, all the more so is it, con is it prohibited to consult magicians, menachashim, mechashvim, sorcerers, magicians, by any other name. It's all simply prohibited to consult them, to ask them what to do. Following their advice is not only silly, but prohibited. What you have to do is use the application of the human mind to figure out, based on reason, what the best solution to your problem is. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch goes on and says, even though we reject entirely everything which is superstitious, the Shulchan Aruch goes on and says, and these are still the words of the Shulchan Aruch, Nahagu she'en matchilim biyom sheni biyom revi. It is still the practice not to begin any business endeavor on uh, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. 
You know, we don't begin any business endeavors on Mondays or Wednesdays. That's not for superstitious reasons. That's that's okay. Uh, that, 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 that's correct to refrain from beginning a business adventure on Mondays or Wednesdays. Further, ain't no sim nashim but me Louis Levana. Uh, uh, we also don't don't get married. We, we don't perform marriages except in the first half of the Jewish month, when the moon is growing, not when the moon is shrinking. Uh, these are not superstitious procedures, which are silly and therefore prohibited. Uh, these make sense. Now we know why in the mind of Rabbi Yosef Kara, we know why from the point of view of the Shohanach, these things make sense, because these are simmin tov, these are good signs intended to remind you that when you begin your business endeavor, uh, it's good to pray and connect yourself uh, to the spiritual truth of God at, at the beginning of your business endeavor, and that's something to be reminded of. And when you begin uh, married life, of course you want to do that with a spiritual connection with God as well. The Ramah adds, Lachain, therefore, Nahagu Gamkain Lachatchil Lulmod Belosh Chodesh, therefore it's customary in yeshivas, and to this very day it's customary in yeshivas, to begin the semester to begin the Zman Limud on Rosh Chodesh, on the day when the moon is born, the new moon is born and starts growing, that's the day to begin the semester, to begin the Zman Limudim in Yeshiva, not because there's some auspicious influence of the moon somehow going to influence the success of the students in the Yeshiva, but this is to remind you that uh, if you're going to engage in the spiritual activity of learning Torah, you want to daven, you want to pray to God for success. We don't, we don't begin the semester on Rosh Hodesh because we expect some magical uh, result to come from the new moon. We begin the semester, we begin the Zmanli moon on Rosh Hodesh because that's a simon tov, and a simon tov, a good sign, is simply something to remind us that this is a spiritual endeavor. If you did not consult the astrologers, they published their, 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 their instructions on a big sign, on a billboard, and you did not ask them for advice, but they gave you their advice without you having asked for it. Shoshokhanov just told us, that we're not allowed to consult the astrologers. Uh, what if you don't consult them? Uh, what if they come to you and without, without you soliciting their, their advice at all, uh, they give you their advice unsolicited? Now you, you didn't consult them, but they told you uh, what their opinion is. Lo ya'aser v'lo yismoch alanes. We don't want to uh, rely upon miracles. Uh, we, maybe. The astrologers are correct. There's nothing wrong with being choshesh. There's nothing wrong with being concerned with what the astrologers told you. If what the astrologers told you makes you nervous and you want to uh, conform to their advice, uh, that, 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 that's okay. Uh, you didn't ask them for advice. You didn't consult them. They came to you and gave you their advice. And if this makes you nervous, well, uh, if you're nervous, then uh, if this bothers you, then uh, uh, follow their advice and you'll calm down and all will be well. The verse in the Torah which commands us to be one with God and to be pure prohibits us from approaching the astrologers. We cannot approach them. We cannot solicit their opinion. We cannot consult with them. But if we don't approach them, if they approach us, if we don't solicit their opinion, they give us their opinion unasked for. Uh, we do not consult with them. They just uh, put up a billboard in front of our house telling us uh, what to do or what not to do. If, it, if you are concerned, if you are choshesh, if it makes you nervous, then there's no particular objection to uh, following their advice if that's what, what's going to calm you down, as we've seen in the past. Uh, Rav Tzadik uh, one of the greatest 
of the 19th century Hasidic masters, uh, one of the all-time great Hasidic masters, Rabbi Tzadik HaKohen of Lublin, uh, pointed out that uh, anything which is going to make you nervous, even though it's pure superstition, but still, if the superstition makes you nervous, then of course, uh, you have to do what you have to do to calm down and, uh, and, uh, and, and avoid the problems which superstition have created for you. Uh, what the Rav should do, if the Rav is consulted, someone comes to me and says, Rav, Rabbi, uh, I heard from the astrologers that such and such a terrible thing is going to happen to me next Wednesday. Uh, uh, what should I do uh, to avoid it? I'm, I'm, very, I'm very nervous. I'm very upset. I'm very concerned with what the astrologers told me. I didn't consult them. I didn't approach them. They came to me. I, I, I surely didn't violate what it says in the Shulchan Aruch. But uh, now, uh, unsolicited and unasked for, they gave me advice about what's going to happen to something terrible next Wednesday. Rabbi, Rabbi, what can I do? Uh, the rabbi should think of some way to uh, uh, to calm the questioner down, uh, uh, to make him feel better. Uh, advise him, uh, advise him. Immerse yourself in the mikveh three times. Uh, that'll cancel the uh, uh, the decree of the astrologers. Or uh, give uh, uh, give a good donation uh, for tzedakah. Find you. Find your favorite uh, uh, your favorite tzedakah charity organization and give them a good uh, give them a good donation. Uh, learn uh, learn uh, three chapters of of, of Mishnayos. Well, it, it hardly matters what good advice the Rav gives the personer person as long as the advice will be successful and eliminate the fear from the person's mind. As long as long as he or she is afraid about what's going to happen next Wednesday because he or she heard the prediction of the astrologers that fear alone is dangerous. The fear alone uh, can have a bad result. And what the, what the rabbi has to do is, as well as he can, eliminate that fear and then all will be well. But the Taz, in his commentary on the text we just saw in the Shulchan Aruch, says, the reason not to begin a business endeavor on Mondays or Wednesdays, the reason is, the celestial bodies which, uh, which are ascendant. On Mondays and Wednesdays are celestial bodies which have bad uh, astral influences upon us, and therefore, if you are depressed, if you are nervous, if you are afraid on those days, you're not going to pray so well. You're going to find it more difficult to attach yourself uh, to spiritual life, to Torah and mitzvahs, and therefore it would be better to begin your, your business adventure on a day when you are at peace and can daven and pray properly. Let's go one step further. This is not right. This is not right. So we have to the wrong page. So we have the right page. Yes, we do. Here we go. Uh, the, 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 ne, ne, next, we want to look at the Bir Hagra. Remember the Gra, the Gaon Mavilda? He explains the whole issue as follows. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays are concerned, Shulchan Aruch told us not to begin Mondays and Wednesdays. We just read the opinion of the Taz. Why? Mondays and Wednesdays are bad because of the celestial movements of the stars on those days. Uh, the Gra says as follows, and these are the words of the Gra. I am, take a look, Zohar, in the Holy Zohar, the great book of Jewish mysticism, Parshas Pinchas, in the chapter Pinchas, in the corresponding to the Parsha Tashavua Pinchas. Uh, those are the words of the Gra. Now, when you read these words of the Gra, uh, the Gra is commanding you to look into the Zohar. And therefore, the only way to figure out the point of the Gra is to open up the Zohar and see what is written there. Let's take a look at the text of the Zohar to which the Gra sends us 
in order to understand why business enterprises should not begin on Mondays and Wednesdays. Here are the words of the, of the Zohar Kodesh. Here are the words of the Zohar. Zohar is written in Aramaic. Ihi ikri She, and the Zohar is talking about the, the evil spirit, uh, which is uh, spoken about frequently, who is spoken about frequently throughout Zoharic literature. She, this evil spirit, is sometimes called the spleen. The spleen is one of our internal organs, and uh, sometimes, sometimes the evil spirit is called the spleen. Tchol. Ihi azlat v'chiyacha binoka. She goes and laughs with her children. The evil spirit goes and laughs with her children. Ubasa. Uh, uh, Ruksa, then she gets mad at her children. Uh, she kills them. Lilith, the evil spirit, kills her children. The uh, Alahu, then she cries for her children, who she just murdered. That's uh, the evil spirit, which is spoken about so often in the Zohar, uh, and that's what she does. Sometimes she is called spleen. Uh, tcho, she's called spleen. Spleen is, is like the liver, you know, the Zohar says. There's some similarity, some connection between the spleen and the liver. Azla da avre besheni the da beravi. The spleen and the liver were created on Monday and Wednesday, respectively. Back in the early days, back in the days of Mycebracious, back in the days when, when God was creating the world, the spleen and the liver were created on two different days, Mondays and Wednesdays, respect, respect, respectively. And the Uvde de Bracious, that's what happened in the act of creation. And Begin uh, Da, uh, because of this, Lepsi Manatava Besheni Uravi, because of this. Uh, Mondays and Wednesdays to this very day are not a simon tov. Covid, liver. Wednesdays, liver. Wednesdays means mota de ravrave, has to do with adults dying. Tro, spleen, which is another name for the, the bad spirit, is uh, mota lazutre, has to do with the death of children. Now, now, now this is a tiny passage from the mystical works of the Zohar, and the reason the Gro, the Gaon Mavilna, refers us to this passage is simply as follows. If you do something, or if you refrain from doing something for superstitious reasons, you are guilty of violating the principle of the Shohan Aruch. You are guilty of violating the principle of tamim tihye imashem elokecha, if you do or refrain from doing anything for superstitious reasons, you are guilty of violating the verse in the Torah which commands us to be pure and one with God. If, however, you do something or refrain from doing something because that's what it says, in our rabbinic sources, that's what it says in the Mishnah, that's what it says in the Gemara, in the Midrash, in the Zohar. If your actions are based not on superstitious reasons, but on literary sources in rabbinic literature, then you, you are doing it not because of superstition. You are doing it because that's what you found in the rabbinic literature. That's what you found in the Zohar. And therefore, anyone who does anything or refrains from doing anything because it says so in the Zohar or it says so in the Gemara or it says, that's what the Rambam said or there's some good rabbinic source for doing or refraining from doing uh, whatever the activity is, then you're off the hook for superstition. And the reason your motivation is not superstition and therefore all is well. What is prohibited is 
guiding your actions on the basis of superstition. If your actions are guided on the basis of rabbinic literature, then you are surely not guilty of violating the principle of Shulchan Aruch and all is well. Therefore, as far as beginning business practices on Mondays and Wednesdays is concerned, the Gras says, if the reason you refrain from uh, beginning a business activity, a business enterprise, on Monday or, Thursday, or Monday or Wednesday, if the reason is superstitious, well, you're in trouble. If, on the other hand, the reason you refrain from beginning a business enterprise on Monday or, or Wednesday is because you found this passage in the Zohar, which talks about the evil spirit and the spleen and the liver, uh, this meaning death for adults, this meaning death for children, if, if that's the reason, if that is what is guiding you in refraining from beginning a business enterprise on Mondays or Wednesdays, uh, you are not guilty of violating the superstition prohibition. You are not uh, allowing yourself to be influenced by superstition. Instead, you're following what it says in the rabbinic sources, and that is kosher that is okay. Let's go one step further. Uh, we know that uh, we have the approach. Uh, Shohan Aruch said uh, Mondays and Wednesdays are bad days. Uh, the Taz said the reason has to do with the position of the stars. The Gra says the reason is because of this passage in the Zohar. Let's go one step further. It also said in the Shohan Aruch that the Zman Limudim the semester in the yeshiva should begin on Rosh Chodesh. Kemosha Amru, just like it says in the Gemara, the anointing of kings is done next to the spring. Uh, just like it says in the Gemara, you pour out wine in front of the Chatan, the Kala, in front of the bride and the groom. Or all, uh, just like it says in the Gemara, that on Rosh Hashanah you eat different kinds of food. Uh, the reason to begin Zman Limudim, the reason to begin Yeshiva studies on Rosh Chodesh is because that will remind you to spiritualize the endeavor. That will remind you to attach yourself to God through prayer, and that will make the Limud, that will make the study of Torah so much better. Similarly, the idea of getting married on certain days, the idea of getting married at certain times of the month, all this is simmentov and therefore uh, acceptable and correct. So uh, let's understand what we have up to this point, and then I'm going to introduce a new topic. Here's what we have up to this point. Those who accept astrology, those who reject astrology, those who take a middle path, holding that some of astrology is indeed an expression of natural law, and therefore to be embraced, other parts of astrology are just silly and superstitious and to be rejected. We have also uh, the middle path, which teaches us that if you are utilizing the position of the stars to remind you to pray, to remind you to attach yourself to a spiritual life, to remind you to engage in a life of Torah and mitzvahs, all is well, but otherwise not. Uh, we have the approach of the Gro, the Gaon Mavilda, who says that if what you are doing is consulting them, you are guilty of violating the Shulchan Aruch. If, however, they come to you without your having consulted them, it, uh, and they may, you are afraid that uh, what they say might be true, well, uh, it's correct to act on your fear, and perhaps the rabbi can, uh, can eliminate that fear by giving you some, some good advice. What we're going to turn to next are, are certain halachot, uh, certain practices in Jewish communities which appear to be rooted in astrological problems. Uh, uh, the first we're going to deal with, and I have to, just have time to introduce it now, is the problem of Kiddush on Friday night. Now, uh, in most communities, probably where you live, uh, surely uh, where I live, in most communities, uh, the practice is 
to go to the synagogue Friday night and after the prayers on Friday night, you come home and the family makes kiddish together on a cup of wine and then the Shabbos meal is eaten. Everyone knows that. But in some communities, and uh, we're not going to get into all the sources tonight, it's going to be for next time. In some Jewish communities, the practice is after finishing the prayers in the synagogue on Friday night, you come home and you don't begin the meal right away. You wait a certain interval of time, and we're going to have to talk about how to calculate this interval of time. You don't make, you don't make Kiddush right away. You wait a certain interval of time. We'll have to talk about this interval of time next week. You wait until Mars, the planet Mars, is no longer ascendant, is no longer uh, 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 conveying its astral influence upon the Earth. During the hours, during the hour, during the hour, during the period of time when Mars is ascendant, Mars, you know, is the red planet uh, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, the name for the planet Mars is Ma'adim, the red planet. Uh, Mars is the planet of death and destruction. And since Mars is the planet of death and destruction, you don't want to make Kiddush Friday night when Mars is ascendant, and therefore when you come back from the synagogue, you have to wait a certain interval of time and then make Kiddush. Now, now, particularly in Hasidic circles, particular, not only in Hasidic circles, but particularly, especially in Hasidic circles, this is a very common practice. What we're going to do next week is we will investigate the sources for this idea, and we will see the way the post can deal with the interface, the interaction between uh, uh, astrological knowledge, astrological wisdom, astrology on the one hand, and Torah practice on the other hand. Uh, making Kiddush, or uh, other, other mitzvahs we'll have to talk about as well, under the influence of certain stars, well, uh, next week, Im Yetzir Hashem, we'll see what the post can have to say about that. Until then, I wish you a uh, Shabbat Shalom, eventually a Shabbat Shalom, and look forward to seeing you all again a week from tonight. A week from tonight. Until then, Shalom Shalom.